So in the last message, uh, we talked about the 144,000 standing with Jesus. Um, we talked about the fact that they were singing a new song, that they follow Jesus wherever they go. This is the sanctified group that was set apart to God. Uh, and we talked about the contrast between them and the ones who worship the mark of the beast. And uh, furthermore, the bulk of the message last time, you may recall that we talked about the gospel. Uh, we talked about the angel preaching what is said to be the eternal gospel. And uh, I tried to go into some detail about laying out all of the relevant, uh, relevant uh, biblical information, uh, starting with God and our position before God and so on and so forth. And uh, I wanted to just uh, kind of top that off today by saying Romans 10.9 says, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And uh, I came to realize, if anything, I went a little light on during that message. It was probably uh, emphasizing Jesus' resurrection um, because Jesus' resurrection, Scripture says that he was raised for our justification. And Jesus being raised from the dead is like the ultimate stamp of approval or vindication, if you will, of all that Jesus claimed to be and all that Jesus said that he did on our behalf. And we can take any other religious system in the world. Muhammad, for example, died, stayed dead. Buddha made claims, died, stayed dead. Only Jesus Christ made these claims and then rose again uh, and is now at the right hand of the Father where he lives forevermore. So just a very important, vital part of the faith is the fact that Jesus was resurrected. And from an apologetics or an argumentative standpoint, uh, if anybody had ever simply produced Jesus' body, Christianity would have been a really short movement. Uh, but they didn't, of course, because it was nowhere to be found, because he was up moving about and appearing to his disciples and also more than 500 other believers as well. So with that, uh, let's go into Revelation 14. I'm going to read just a short section. We're going to have a, a shorter message today than I normally do because um, we wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time to hear about Operation Christmas Child. So uh, I'm just going to talk about a very small portion of... Uh, chapter 14 today. I'm just going to read verses 6 through 8, Revelation chapter 14. Beginning in verse 6, the word of God says, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. With that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words. Uh, we just ask for you, Father, to convict us uh, of an, the importance and also a, a balanced view of what it means to fear you. Uh, Father, your word is very, very clear. Uh, fear for a believer is a very, very different thing than the fear that an unbeliever should have. And we just ask that in your grace you would impart to us uh, the importance in knowing the difference. Uh, we ask that you would be glorified through your Son, Jesus Christ, and we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so here in this portion of chapter 14, we already touched a little bit on the fact when we talked about this gospel, that this angel is flying through mid-heaven, and the angel has been given a message to preach. Uh, I argued, uh, hopefully pretty strongly last time, that I think that uh, since this tells us this is an eternal gospel, uh, that this is the one and only gospel, the gospel of the good news 
in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what the name uh, or the word gospel means. It literally means good news. And it is, in fact, the best news that we will ever hear. Um, and it's nice because we've had the words good news up here on the screen all morning as well. <clears throat> So, again, there is included here, definitely, very clearly, a message of warning of the coming judgment, which, as I told you last time, is also an important part of the gospel message, because we can in no way really appreciate the good news unless we know what the bad news is. And, of course, the bad news, simply put, is we are sinners before God who stand condemned. And unless we do something about that problem, uh, we are in big trouble. And so this is the importance here to show people their need for a Savior and the fact that they can only be saved by putting their trust in Jesus Christ. So here we see the weight of that, uh, the fact that what is being preached here is the warning of this impending judgment that is about to come. So in verse 6, we read that we are to fear God and to give him glory. And I mentioned briefly in a previous message that, as I just prayed, we are to understand the fact that as believers, our fear of God is a very, very different thing than it is or should be for an unbeliever. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the fear of the believer should be a reverential fear, okay? It's a... Uh, I think one of the best examples, just because of the way that Scripture presents God as being our Heavenly Father, and the way numerous passages in Scripture teach off of this model, that the best way for us to understand this reverence is we are to re revere God with a healthy fear, a healthy and constructive fear, just the way we would with a godly, earthly father. Uh, so if an earthly father is tasked with the uh, with the purpose of helping us to grow up, helping to discipline and teach us, uh, then that's very much the way that, that we should uh, revere God uh, as well. So a father has authority over us, a God-given authority, by the way, and as I said, is responsible for teaching and correcting us. Uh, in a similar way, this is this picture that we're given, particularly I find in the book of Hebrews. Uh, our earthly fathers, they're just humans. Um, none of us do it perfectly, but they're charged with this task. And this is very much uh, an image that is presented in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, so I want to read that scripture to you. This is from Hebrews 12, verse 4 and following. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are punished by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he punishes every son whom he accepts. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems not to be pleasant, but painful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So we see here that actually uh, the reality is sometimes believers do get uh, treated rather harshly, uh, but it is not without a purpose. And that purpose is for our own betterment and our own discipline. Uh, and as we just read right here, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. It shapes us and forms us further and further into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Furthermore, Hebrews 12:28 goes on to state, Therefore, 
Since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So this is one of those things that I think it's important for us to keep a healthy balance on. In the one hand, God has redeemed us and brought us so close to him that we can refer to him as our father. Yet at the same time, in his holiness, his righteousness, and his justice, we are to stand in reverential awe of him and who he is. So we can only really appreciate being called the children of God when we understand what it took to bring us into this relationship with him. So the point here is to have reverential fear for the Lord and to submit to his discipline. And it's a, a lesson from the lesser to the greater as it's being presented here, as if you recall, we saw so often in the book of Hebrews. If we submitted to the discipline of our earthly fathers and we respected them, how much more so should be we, we be willing to submit and be reverential to our heavenly father as he is so much greater and so much more perfect in his being. Now I have to tell you here, I started obviously going through some personal experiences here. And one of the things growing up, a couple of things occurred to me. One was a particular incident incident where I think uh, my brother's reverential fear for my father showed. In fact, it might have crossed over from reverential into just plain fear, but... um, I remember this one time we were hauling firewood with one of my dad's pickup trucks. Uh, We had an old 82 Chevrolet, an old square body, and once the firewood was cut up, my brother and I usually had the job of hauling the wood and then stacking it in the basement. So we would take my dad's old pickup and we would stack wood across the tailgate as far as we could reach in and take it out, and we'd drive it up and then we'd pull up to the cellar and then we'd carry it in and stack the wood. Uh, My dad has a different system now since we moved out, uh, which is a little less uh, manually intensive. So uh, one day I was in in the cellar kind of rearranging the wood and it kind of dawned on me, well, he's taken an awful lot of time to get up here with the wood. So I come out around our cellar doors up into the driveway up over the hill and I see my brother right on a dead run, just heading down the driveway. And I said, where are you going? And he said, I don't know, but I'm not staying here. And he didn't even break stride. He was hauling out of there as tight as he could go. So I'm like, well, that's kind of strange. And I watch him, and he went down the L of our driveway out to the main road and just kept right on running. So I'm like, well, what's going on? So I went up, and there was the pickup truck sitting there. And as I recall, it was still idling, sitting there in park. And I walked around the truck, and then I realized what my brother was so scared about. When I walked around the front of the truck, the driver's side door was folded this way, right up to the front fender. And I'm not a detective, but I was able to figure out pretty easily what happened. So some of the wood was in a pile behind the truck. It had obviously fallen off, and I figured out that my brother had opened the door, saw that the wood was back there, selected reverse, backed up, and then hit a really hard snowbank, and then folded the door right up against the side of the truck. So then I was almost as scared as he was because I, I wasn't looking forward to you know, showing this to my dad. So I went and I tried to bend the door back as best I could and I wasn't having much luck. As I recall, I was somewhere maybe junior high or maybe a freshman in high school. Uh, my brother would have been around middle school age probably. So pretty quick my dad shows up, you know, and... and uh, I told him what happened, and he said, well, where's your brother? And I'm thinking to myself, well, given his speed and trajectory, I would guess somewhere in Newburgh. <laughs> uh, but I told my dad, I said, well, he, you know, he took off running. And I really think my dad was somewhat hurt, you know. I really think that uh, he was kind of upset. My dad never said a word. Uh, he went back, selected a couple of small sticks of wood, put them in the hinge, And I was actually amazed with the skill with which he took two sticks of wood and bent those hinges back into shape, slammed the door, the door lined up perfectly, and we drove that truck for years after that. 
And he never said a word, and I don't think he had to. I think, uh, you know, to this day, I don't back a vehicle up and not really think about making sure that I don't have the door open. <clears throat> so perhaps that type of fear probably crossed over beyond the reverential. But as a lot of kids are, I can recall very clearly that my teenage mind was very prone to having delusions of grandeur. And sometimes I would forget my place in relation to my father's place. And my father was always quick to put me back into my place. And he could do so at will uh, because he had the authority and he had the power to do so. And I am very, very thankful for that because that is where I get my own personal respect for authority. Because as I said, our parents are uh, placed in authority over us through the delegation of God. They have God's authority in doing so. And it's a huge responsibility. That authority in turn can have a very big uh, effect on how we interpret other God-ordained authorities, including the government and the police and so on and so forth. So a healthy respect for that authority is very, very important and is something that I am very, very grateful for. So how much more should we have reverential fear and awe of God? Who, uh, as I said in the last message, uh, is our creator, he is uh, not only our creator, but he has the ability to enforce that which he is in control of over his creatures. As creator, God has the right and the authority to make demands of his creatures. He has the right to establish the rules and the right to demand uh, that we respect those rules. And uh, I mentioned the other day, God is uh, omnipotent, he's all-powerful, he's omniscient, he's all-knowing, and he's omnipresent, he is everywhere. Uh, we can't run away from him, uh, we can't do any of that. Um, it, it's foolish to try to run away from God or to try to usurp his authority. But of course, we see uh, people do that all the time. There is a very, very clear picture that is presented in Scripture. In fact, my, myself, I was very touched when I went back and I reviewed some of the Scriptures that have to talk about fearing God. Uh, I'm going to give you just the tip of the iceberg here of how important, biblically, the fear of God is. Proverbs 1.7 states that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. So very, very instructive, and it goes on and on. Proverbs 14.7 says, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, that one may turn away from the snares of death. Proverbs 15.16, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Proverbs 19.23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. So we see an overriding theme here, that fear of the Lord is a healthy fear, and that fear leads to good outcomes. And this is the overriding uh, message of Scripture. Psalm 14, 1 and following says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed detestable acts. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of mankind to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. Together they are corrupt. There is no one who does good. No, not even one. And of course, the Apostle Paul quotes this scripture and includes it in Romans 1 when uh, he is talking about uh, this indictment that he brings against all humanity. Every one of us in our natural state is hostile to God, and we don't even want God in our thinking. We're hostile to the ways of God. Well, this healthy fear of God brings us into a right way of thinking and brings us into the fact that we need to do things God's way, and ultimately, of course, that we need salvation in Christ more than anything. 
And I should point out here, as I said, this is an indictment of all humanity. Um, this is not an us versus them thing, because in our natural state, we were guilty of all the same things. Uh, and of course, it's important that we realize that uh, about this world. So if we look out our windows or we, you know, we talk uh, about the things that we see on the news, it can be very discouraging because, of course, we live in a society where, for the most part, fear of God is the last thing on anybody's mind. And we see a, uh, what I call a Burger King society where everybody wants it their way. Um, and without God, uh, as I said earlier, without God, uh, as Dostoevsky says, all things are permissible. Uh, without a higher authority who declares what's right and wrong, we're just down to whatever we prefer as human beings. And nobody can say that's right or this is wrong. All we can say is, I don't agree with your preferences. And of course, Scripture uh, has a much, much different uh, picture because Scripture demonstrates to us there is a God who is in heaven who has authority over his creatures. Uh, one of the things that we see in society is we see constantly that people are trying to remove God. Uh, we see this in the scientific world. Uh, uh, many people in the scientific world have put forth theories that in their mind uh, eliminates the need for God. They say, well, we don't need God anymore because we know where human beings come from and we have evolution and the world was created through the Big Bang and so on and so forth. Uh, don't be fooled, because none of this uh, accounts for a first cause at all. Uh, even if you subscribe to those theories, which I don't personally recommend, then you're still left needing a first cause. The Big Bang Theory, for example, it, if all the matter of the universe was compressed down into one little place before it went bang, what was right before that? Where did it come from? R.C. Sproul actually asked that question of Carl Sagan. Uh, he saw him at a gathering and asked him, hey, right before the Big Bang, what was right before that? Carl Sagan's answer was, I don't want to go there. Isn't that interesting for a, for a scientist to say, I don't want to go there? Uh, I think it's because he knew the implications. The implication was, of course, that if there was a creator and everything started with a creator, we're accountable. And people are constantly trying to dodge being accountable to their creator because we don't want God in our thinking. And ultimately, intellectually, uh, this isn't an intellectual problem. This is a moral problem. Uh, intellectually, I think that uh, everything works rather nicely. Uh, as Pastor Steve has often said, uh, what we know about scripture fits the facts. It does. Uh, I don't leave my brain in a box outside the church when I come in. I like to think of myself as a rational human being and a bit of a thinker, and I find no problem between the two. But recognize what people's ultimate hang-up really is, is that moral problem where they don't want to be accountable uh, to a creator God. Because they know if God exists, they are ultimately in big trouble. Scripture often grounds the authority and supremacy of God in the fact that God is the creator. And here in chapter 14 is no, is no exception. He made everything, the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And given the nature and the person and his character, as I said, he has the authority and the means to hold us accountable. Furthermore, I like what Henry Morris had to say, because I think it's absolutely true. He said, if you believe Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you really believe that in your mind and in your heart, you will have no problem with anything else that's written in Scripture. Because if God is the creator, then he has the ability to do all of the things that we read about in Scripture. And he has the ability to bring all of his promises to pass. <clears throat> I also should note as a bit of a side note here, when we talk about the springs of water, think about back in chapter 8, when we read about the wormwood falling into the water and making them poisoned, and then many people dying from drinking of the water. 
at this point in the tribulation, water is probably going to be a very valuable commodity. And so I suspect that's exactly why such attention is drawn to the springs of water here in Revelation chapter 14. <clears throat> I want to uh, probably close out here just a little bit early, uh, but I wanted to focus especially in on the fact here that when we talk about the gospel, that this focus on the fear of God and the glory of God is very much in focus when it comes to our salvation. Uh, God saves us for the very purpose of putting his glory on display. And even Jesus in his high priestly prayer, he prayed, Father, those you have given me, I want them to be where I am so that they can see my glory. And so the grand and great purpose of God's glory is so that he would have a host of very thankful and grateful people who would forever be in his presence to sing his praises and to honor him for all that he has done in creation and through salvation. And like I said, we're really going to appreciate heaven when we get there. Uh, having known this falling world and all of the uh, troubles and the trials and the tribulations that we've been through in this fallen world, how much more are we going to appreciate living in a place where there's no more evil, there's no more sickness, there's no more death, and we will forever be directly in the presence of God to behold his glory. And I hope to talk uh, more thoroughly about the glory of God in the next message. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Uh, we ask in the, in the wisdom granted by your Holy Spirit, Father, uh, that you would impart to us the importance of having a referential fear, uh, a fear of you. Yes, you are our Father. Yes, we can call you Abba. We can approach you uh, because of what Jesus has done, and we can have an intimate relationship with you. But we, may we never lose sight of who you are of the very otherness of your nature, your holiness, uh, your supreme justice, and your perfect character. Uh, we just ask that you would uh, hold us in this reverential awe of yourself and the need and the patience also to help others come to see the importance that they fear and glorify you as well. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I thank you and I hope you all have a very blessed Sunday.